Good morning, everybody. Yes, I'll be talking about um, the water supply that we get from forested catchments for Melbourne, which is about 65, 70% of our supply, um, just to put it into sort of context. I'll very quickly zip through what Melbourne Water does for people in the room that don't know the forested water supply catchments, or again, very quickly. I'll talk about fire in the catchments. You, it's, we're talking about yield, but you can't talk about yield without talking about fire. And I'll talk about the interplay of forests, fire and water yield, and water quality. Um, I'd like to point out that most of the work has, in the last 10 years has actually been done by the University of Melbourne in collaboration with them for the last 10 plus years, but there's some stuff here from a very, very long time ago. So what does Melbourne Water do? We're a wholesaler. We basically supply water to Yarra Valley Water, City West, uh, sorry, Greater Western Water and South East Water, and then we take away their sewage, treat it and discharge it. Um, we also, what else do we do? Um, we also manage waterways. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> It's much, much smaller here. <laughs> uh, we also um, manage waterways, drainage and flood management, which a few people are not very happy with at the moment. So this is, again, going to be extremely... This is going to be the rapid-fire shot through the catchments and how we supply them. The green areas are the protected catchment areas, and the easiest way to think of how the water goes to the system is it goes from east to west. And it's not working. Yes, it is. So it goes from Thompson via tunnel to Upper Yarra. I apologise to the people online, you can't see the laser pointer. And from Upper Yarra, it goes down two conduits to Sylvan. Along the way, it picks up water from O'Shaughnessy, Armstrong's, McMahon's and Starvation Creek. And also from Corrandirk, which is also gets into Sylvan. Once it gets into Sylvan, it gets distributed to the rest of the system. This is all done by gravity. Um, I'm not going to talk about the rest of the system, except to point out Wallaby Creek, which is up through here. Um, and also we pump out of the Yarra at Yering Gorge, which is between uh, Yarra Glen and Warrandyte, and pump into Sugarloaf Reservoir. But because all this catchment above here is open and there's lots of viticulture people and about 12 million septic tanks, I think, um, we, don't, uh, we have to fully treat that before it goes into supply. This is the classic PR shot of what our catchments look like, all forested, exactly what um, some, some of them don't look like that, but that's what they generally look like. Um, we're a bit unusual. Most of our water is unfiltered. So 60, odd, 60 to 70 per cent of our water supply is unfiltered because the water quality is good enough and well, very, very good. Um, so we have a disinfection only system and that's partly because there's restrictions to, in access to these catchments. There's no, no recreation or limited recreation. There's no habitation, no mining. Um, soon to be no logging, and logging is essentially finished in the Yarra Valley already. Um, so that's very unusual these days. Now, I put up the land tenure pie chart because a lot of people are under the impression that we directly manage these this catchment areas, which is around 155,000 hectares. We don't. Um, we, Parks Victoria manage the bulk of it, Upper Yarra, for example, as a national park. Um, we have a significant say in what goes on there because under the Parks Act, water is a, a paramount consideration. Uh, Deca manage all the state forests, which is the tributaries and Thompson. The other thing I'd like to point out is that pie chart does not include any private land in the Mid Yarra, and we can theoretically take water from the Goulburn catchment, although we never have. So what do you get for keeping all the people out? The first thing you get is you reduce your fire starts by at least 50% in catchment. I noticed someone put up 75% yesterday. I was trying to be nice and conservative, not too provocative. I've certainly seen numbers as high as 94 um, but there's a significant reduction in fire. Notably, a lot of fires that impact our catchment start outside the catchment and sweep through. You get a significantly re reduced pathogen load. The best way to catch a human disease is from another human. Um, so if you keep the people out, it just breaks that nexus. Um, we get no or limited zoonotic transfer because particularly by keeping cattle out, cattle are not very good. Um, and because of that, we have a chlorine disinfection system that essentially is aimed at bacteria to counteract the bird activity on the reservoir, which is primarily Campylobacter. So the graphic to the right is the E. coli data for the last 12 months. I just grabbed it. Um, e. coli being an indicator of faecal contamination, not usually a pathogen in itself, although it can be. Um, the dark blue bars are at Yering Gorge, where we pump out of the mid Yarra, and the pale blue bars are the upper Yarra water where it enters Sylvan. So it's at depth going into Sylvan. Um, and you can see, and you probably can't see, but the average E. coli for, up, for Upper Yarra is seven coming in for the last 12 months. I might have got lucky with the last 12 months, but nonetheless. <laughs> um, but even so, the maximum E. coli is quite low, and this Upper Yarra 
uh, so the yearing of a thousand, my suspicion is that's the top of the assay as opposed to what's, um, what you actually got. This gives us a very low cost, low energy water. And if we have to filter, it's in, in the order of $3 billion and everyone knows exactly how accurate government estimates are. So the two catchment types, we have ash eucalypt forests and mixed species eucalypt forests. For those that were here yesterday, a lot of people have been talking about them. And it's roughly 50-50 split. Each type has a very different fire response, very different water quality and water yield responses. One of the things I should have said before is you cannot disentangle water quality from yield. You can have plenty of water, but if it's filthy, you've got no yield. So you need to not disentangle them, and a lot of people do. 80% of our stream flow comes from the ash forest. So that's where a lot of the research work has been concentrated. Just to give you an idea of the distribution, because when you say 50-50, everyone imagines each catchment sort of 50-50. That's not how it works. Um, for example, O'Shaughnessy here, dominated by the ash. That's the blue colours. The red are mixed species forests. You can see Thompson and Upper Yarra have got more uh, mixed species than ash. Um, but there's, it works out to be roughly 50-50. When you burn a mixed species forest, a few people put up photos yesterday, you get regeneration through epicormic budding and epicormic shoots, the trees look furry. So that's, this is from photos from 09, and that's, that's a close up. Ash, uh, sorry, uh, mixed species tend to occur at the lower, drier areas, one of the reasons we don't get much yield. They're quite tough, they're hard to kill. There's no significant yield in, an, in a mixed species forest post fire. It is there, but it's a small percentage of a small percentage, and we generally neglect it. Um, until recently, we had no evidence to know whether that was reasonable or not. Because the, the trees don't die after fire, you end, you end up with a mixed age class forest. So you have trees of a whole lot of different ages. So if there is a different tree water use as the tree ages, you're not going to see it as much because it's um, basically spread over a whole lot of different age groups. The issue we have with mixed species forest is water quality. It carries nearly all of our water quality risk, unfortunately through a process called debris flows, which I'll talk about at the end. And you contrast that this is ash forest, Wallaby Creek after the 09 fires, all the ash trees on the left are dead, but at the base you can see a large amount of seedlings. The photo to the right is Richard Benyon, one of the researchers at Melbourne Uni. He's a couple of metres off road, and Richard is not particularly short, um, but that's about 1.7 metres or something tall after 15 months or so and ash regenerates very, very vigorously, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of stems per hectare. The literature quotes it up to a million. I've never seen anything like that. Um, but anyway, that can be very, very vigorous. All the trees are the same age, so any water use signal is highly amplified because all the trees are the same age. They're fi highly fire sensitive <coughs> compared to the mixed species, and they can have very significant yield losses post fire. In contrast to the mixed species, there's essentially no water quality risk from the ash. These are broad generalisations, by the way. One of the things I point out to people, because a lot of people who don't have a lot of experience with fires think that all fires give you the same sort of burn outcome. That's not true. This is Wallaby Creek in 09 on the uh, left, sorry, um, versus Maroondah in 09 on the right. And you can see same fire, very different sort of impacts. And that's quite important. Fires are highly heterogeneous. Okay, I'll talk a bit about ash and the yield issues in ash. This is a very long studied area, so I'm going to start in 1939. This will only take two or three hours, don't worry about it. <laughs> so the 39 fire, you can't talk about yield in for Melbourne without talking about the 39 fire. It burned a large part of, of the state, several million hectares. One thing I will point out is we now have significantly better mapping, which is kind of nice, because it was 1939. Um, you can see on the right, this is again the 09 fires. The resolution is significantly better and more importantly, or as importantly, we're getting fire severity. So we know how hot each part got burnt now. So after the 39 fire, it was noticed very quickly that yields started to drop. Um, and everyone started panicking if you're a water supplier depending on surface water, it's a completely reasonable response. Um, a whole lot of experimental catchments were started in the Maroondah catchment, North Maroondah and Corindurk, and a majority of those are still running today. They're looking at the impact of logging and also the impact of fire. And the reason you're looking at that is because fire and logging at the same scale gives you the same yield impact. So if you cut down the same number of trees, 100 hectares of trees, or you burn 100 hectares of trees and you get the same regeneration, you'll pretty much get the same yield response. So you can see there's a quite dramatic drop in yield 
and John Langford in the mid-70s published the first paper that I'm aware of showing this very dramatic and more importantly very sustained drop in yield. So in the 1980s, um, George Gazira was working at uh, the MMBW back in those days. George is now the Emeritus Professor of Hydrology at the University of Newcastle, well regarded in the area and a nice guy. Um, and he came up with this now infamous or famous, depending on which way you look at it, curve showing the major reduction in yield post-fire, dropping from 1,200 millimetres a year to around the 600 mark at year, age 27 with a very long recovery limb. So fires tend to hurt you from a long, for a long period of time. Um, the problem with the curve is that it, while it answered, are we getting the yield qu back question and how long, it's been generally misused. It's been pretty much mangled and a lot of people have misused it quite dramatically. I've seen some very inappropriate uses of it. So I'll just go through it a little bit. There's some really big key assumption in there. It was fitted to the 39 fire, derived from the 39 fire and the pre-39 fire conditions, nothing else, which is fine because that's what he was asked to do. It assumes you've got 1,200 millimetres of old growth runoff all the time. We've got lots of sites where it's lower and some sites where it's higher. It assumes all the catchment is ash and burnt hot with really good regeneration. That's rare. We've got lots of sites where they get burnt and the regeneration is poor or very patchy, as was pointed out yesterday. Having said all that, it's a really nice, elegant piece of research. It's really well done. Um, and it gives you a very simple, single variable, easy to use model, which uses forest age as the main X variable. So people really like it because you can throw it in a spreadsheet and have a model up in about half an hour. It doesn't have any forest growth dynamics in there. There's nothing in there about regeneration density. There's nothing in there about thinning. I should have mentioned that those very high density regenerations, they thin out very, very quickly from tens of thousands of hectares to uh, tens of thousands of stems per hectare to 30 or 40 or 50 at age 200 or so. So they can dramatically thin. The other little thing is when I started in this area many decades ago, the line was fire kills ash. It was a blanket statement and that's not true. After the 09 fires, we had inventory work done in O'Shaughnessy, um, Wallaby Creek and Maroondah, and the Maroondah, which is a very cool fire, the ash mortality was notably lower than we expected. And as you would expect, ash mortality is actually a function of fire severity, which intuitively makes sense, but previously was regarded as all ash dies with fire. The other thing is all those experimental catchments I mentioned, None of the data reproduces that experiment, that Kazira curve to the same extent. Most of them show an increase in yield post logging or post fire, then a decrease. Some of the decreases are much smaller than, than 50%. Some of them are very persistent. Some of them are still below um, their pre thinning or pre clearing um, at the moment, but they're, they're not the same. The impact very much appears to be dependent on the forest pre and post fire conditions. And I started life, life before Melbourne Water as a yield hydrologist. So it's essentially a start state or an initial conditions uh, thing, which intuitively makes a lot of sense. If you have a very dense forest and then you have a fire and you get very poor regeneration with only a few stems per hectare, you would not expect the same yield that if you had a very, very sparse old fire, 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 forest and then very, very vigorous regeneration with lots and lots of stems per hectare. You wouldn't expect them to get the same yield. So intuitively, it makes sense. And just as a little bit of an illustration, um, this is O'Shaughnessy. O'Shaughnessy got burnt in 2009, about 90 odd percent, most of it cool. You can see the long-term mean annual flow before the fire, 80,000 megs a year roughly. Fire, post-fire, 90,000. So it's actually gone up. I'm waiting for someone in there to go, you can't calculate a mean annual flow based on 13 years of data, and that's completely true. This is not an exhaustive uh, analysis. This is just something I prepared for this presentation. But there's not been a 50% plunge, and it doesn't look like there's going to be a 50% plunge. And this is unfortunately, well, not fortunately, this has been replicated across a few other catchments as well. So I'll just talk a little bit about the mixed species forest and water quality issues. So debris flows. Debris flows are essentially avalanches of rock, sediment and soil down a gully. They can happen at any time in any, any typically in mixed species um, forests. And the issue for us, and this is a photo of Harrietville, which was taken by Peter Nyman. Um, you can see there's a large fan at the bottom of, of soil and rock and there's a lot of incision, thanks, 
a lot of incisions. So you can imagine if this happens in a drinking water reservoir or into a drinking water reservoir, you are literally delivering thousands and thousands of tonnes of sediment to an unfiltered supply, which is exactly what you don't want. Um, as I said, this risk can happen in any time, but the, risk, the probability jumps very dramatically post-fire and remains elevated for at least two years or around two years. We've done a lot of modelling, marrying debris flow modelling with reservoir modelling to try to determine how, how big an impact this, this can be. And unfortunately, it comes out that there's a 10 to 30% chance that Upper Yarra, which is our sort of main reservoir in the middle, um, would be unusable for over a year if we had some of these go fire off after a, um, an event. And a few people have said to me, which is a little bit rude, but uh, they've said to me, um, OK, that's great, you've done all this academic work, but you know, it's just that sort of academic modelling by you know, people at the uni. It um, you know, doesn't mean anything, and I'd like... I generally point out to them that between 2007 and now, we have had Upper Yarra offline three times due to storm events. No fire, just rain. The one in 2021 was pretty big, uh, one in 300, so reasonably unusual. But nonetheless, it, has, it does go offline. And the issue, and this is a lot of twos in it, unfortunately, we typically run at a turbidity around two NTU, and then it went up to about 24, so order of magnitude change, and that took about 20 days but it took over 200 days to come back down to two. So these are long-term issues. They have a long tail, these events. You put all that sediment into a, into a reservoir, lots of fine colloidal material. It's essentially neutrally buoyant. It will remain in suspension just due to normal movement in the reservoir for an extended period, and you're essentially diluting it out by inflows. So that can be a bit of an issue for someone like, for a group like us. So what Melbourne Uni has done, and we, this is Upper Yarra, that's the reservoir, main, Welsh's Creek Arm, the main, main stem. Um, the areas in red are all our high-risk debris flow areas. And as you can pretty clearly see, well, I think you can clearly see, they're all right next to the reservoir, or right next to the rivers that go into the reservoir, which is extremely inconvenient. Um, so we haven't been very happy about that. So we've been looking at mitigation options, preventative options, re rehabilitation, um, things like putting in debris flow nets. Debris flow is a worldwide phenomenon. They're not peculiar to us. You can buy debris flow nets off the shelf from a crowd in Switzerland. Um, so the issue here is obviously is this is all national park. Dumping in lots of concrete and steel and posts and putting in lots of tracks is the sort of thing you just don't do in a national park. So that conversation is just starting now, looking at options like wood shred or other, you know, other, other interventions to actually get everything under control. But we recognise that this is obviously has very significant other values from an ecological point of view, um, but we'd really like to mitigate them if we can. So I'm just going to finish up. The catch-all for this is we get really good water quality, which has got a low pathogen risk. What did I say? Low cost, low energy, and so, because it's all gravity transfer, transfer. And the main take home from my perspective is that we have a short-term water quality issue from our mixed species forest and a long-term or potentially a long-term water yield issue from our ash forest. So they're quite separate. And as I said, that if we did need to treat this, it's in the order of $3 billion, again, a government estimate, so it's always very accurate, um, and uh, 40 to $50 million a year in operational costs. That's it. Thank you very much.